Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Over the course of the past few decades, the People's Republic of China opened up and became a land of economic opportunity not only for South Korean companies, but also for individual entrepreneurs. Today, over 70,000 South Koreans reside in Wangjin, a district of Beijing known as the city's Koreatown. The enclave's quick development has also attracted numerous Chinese citizens of Korean descent from northern China who made it their home. To learn about how Korean Chinese and South Koreans live with each other in Wangjin, we had the honor of meeting with Professor Sharon Yoon. She told us about the history of Korean migration to China, the Korean enclave in Beijing, as well as the difficulties Korean Chinese and South Koreans face when interacting with each other. Sharon Yoon is assistant professor at Iwa Women's University. She obtained her Bachelor in Asian Studies and Sociology from Dartmouth College and her PhD in Sociology from Princeton University. Before joining Iwa, Professor Yoon was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania and at Osaka University. Professor Sharon Yoon, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me today. Why did you decide to focus your research on the Korean diaspora? Um, I've always had an interest in the Korean diaspora because I myself am a second generation Korean American. Um, So for my research, I focus on Koreans in Japan and China, and I wanted to understand how Koreans within Asia understood their identities and formed communities in a way that was similar or different from the Korean American community. You used different methods to research the enclave. You not only conducted interviews and surveys, but also used participant observation. Why is that and what did this entail? I am a sociologist by training. And how that's different from maybe a typical anthropologist is that I believe that not only do you need to go into the field and live among the members of the community, which is what we mean by participant observation, but I also believe that it's really important to pair that, supplement that with more quantitative data or data that allows us to understand what are the broader structural forces that are shaping individual experiences. And so in order to do that, in order to get, I think, at the bigger picture, more of a clear understanding of what is actually going on, I think that it's important to combine interview data, participant observation, as well as survey data. So I combined all three for my dissertation research. Let's begin with the situation today. How many Koreans are there in China? Where do they mostly live? And are they Korean citizens? Are they Korean ethnics? What are they? So there are about 2.5 million Koreans in China, according to statistics in 2009. About 2 million of these Koreans have Chinese citizenship. And the vast majority of them, before the 1990s, used to live in the three northeastern provinces in China, known as uh, Jilin, Liaoning, and Heilongjiang. After the 1990s, actually after the 1980s, with Deng Xiaoping's market reforms, there was a huge wave of uh, rural migrants, not only the Korean Chinese, but rural migrants all over China who are starting to take advantage of uh, new laws that allow them to move around the country in order to find better jobs in urban areas. So the Korean Chinese also moved along with them. But what really happened, what really triggered their massive wave of urban migration for the Korean Chinese was in 1992, after South Korea and China established diplomatic normalization, that allowed for a lot of South Koreans to start to come into China in order to try and expand their businesses. Um, And what that created was a strong demand for bilingual workers who could act as intermediaries. And so due to this demand, a lot of the Korean Chinese starting the 1990s started to move and work in South Korean firms in massive numbers in Beijing, Shanghai. And what I look at is the interaction between the Korean Chinese and the South Koreans. In your thesis, you divide Koreans in two main groups, those who came before the PRC was created and those who came since 1992, as you just said. Could you maybe describe what the typical Korean Chinese and South Korean migrants look like? What are characteristics about them? So as you said, there are two distinct groups of Koreans in China. And we can distinguish them by their waves of migration. The first wave of migration are the Korean Chinese, as you pointed out. And those are third and fourth generation Korean minorities. And so I think in terms of their physical appearance, 
they might look more Chinese to you than a Korean might. These Korean Chinese are also largely from the countryside. As I said, in the three northeastern provinces, they tilled rice paddies during the Mao Zedong era for about three generations. And so on the surface, they might look more rural to you. They might have lower levels of education, but it depends on how we compare them relative to what population. So relative to the Koreans, they might seem more Chinese, they might seem more rural, but relative to the Han Chinese population, they seem actually very urban and they actually looked like South Korean. So I think physical appearance is really difficult to describe as a marker of distinction. It's mostly where their cultural identities lie and their cultural differences are one is more culturally hybrid than the other. When meeting for the first time, are South Koreans and Korean Chinese able to tell which group is one part of? They are able to distinguish themselves. It's mostly, though, by their manners of behavior and speech. I think speech is a strong marker of distinction in the sense that the Korean Chinese speak a dialect of Korean, and you can tell by the way their intonation, the types of words that they use. Even though it's Korean, it's a different type of Korean than South Koreans speak. The one kind of caveat, however, is that a lot of these Korean Chinese are working in South Korea as well. So they're circular migrants. And by working in South Korea, a lot of them are able to assimilate into South Korean society and are able to mask their speech. So a lot of the more kind of culturally nuanced minorities are able to mask their accents. So I think that's actually what's really interesting about Korean Chinese. They're very ambiguous as a minority group. Our discussion today will focus on the Wangjin enclave in Beijing, which now contains the largest concentration of South Koreans in the PRC. You wrote that a decade ago, it was a virtually underdeveloped expanse of land. What happened and how did it develop so quickly? In 2001, China entered the WTO. And as China entered the WTO, they liberalized laws that made it easier for foreigners to live in China and to conduct business in China. And this created a second large wave of South Koreans entering into Beijing. Part of these liberalization of laws made it more feasible for South Koreans to find housing in Beijing. So prior to this era, foreigners could only live in particular sections of the city. And within these sections, there were kind of like these foreign dormitories. And these former dormitories were extremely expensive. They were so expensive that it was virtually impossible for an average South Korean businessman to live there, unless you were a foreign dignitary. What happened in 2001 was the real estate market opened its doors a bit more to foreigners like South Koreans. And one of the areas where it developed was Wangjing. Wangjing is a planned neighborhood that the government was trying to use in order to attract foreign direct investment. And a lot of these landlords, they started to rent out their apartment units to South Koreans. And once a few kind of Koreans started to move in, then like a massive number started to move in. And it was easy for a massive number to move in because of the chebol. The chebol has kind of a rotating system where they have a batch of expatriate workers coming into work for two to three years. And they're looking for some that's really convenient and where there are Korean language services and cultural goods that they're looking for. They want a convenient and comfortable life. And so kind of these conditions allowed Wangjing to explode into a really huge enclave um, in a matter of years. What do we mean by enclave in sociology? And are there any specific characteristics ascribed to them? What we mean by enclave The concept of the enclave was first developed by Alejandro Portes in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And he wanted to look at how ethnic minorities, when they were living within a confined space and they were building businesses that were catering to their own in-group population, how these enclaves, these kind of spatial concentrated neighborhoods, would allow ethnic minorities who were otherwise disadvantaged to find a way to grow their businesses and become successful and move up the socioeconomic ladder. 
And so my theory of the enclave kind of is inspired by this first notion of the enclave that Portes built. And what I'm looking at is this understanding of how people, when they live and they work within one kind of confined spatial area, how that builds an, a concept of a community and that how that community affects their economic lives. Is there anything inherently unique about Wangjin that differentiates it from other enclaves in general, and more specifically from other Korean enclaves such as those in Japan or in the US? So there's a broader trend now in the past 10 years with the globalization of markets, of people uh, moving around with technology and airplane costs going down. People are moving around much more than they used to, right? So I think there's a broader trend going on around the world where communities that ethnic minorities have lived in are not just places where they settle and they build a life for themselves, but now they're moving back and forth. So what we thought of as kind of a confined, tightly knit community is no longer confined. It's actually much more porous and it has a strong connection, what we call a transnational tie to the home country. Wangjing is special in the case that it's not different from Korean diaspora communities around the world per se, but it's special in the sense that it's a new kind of enclave that's only emerged in the past 10 to 20 years. So what my research tries to do is look at how this new type of transnational enclave affects their lives, their communities, their livelihoods. What about other Korean enclaves but in China? Are they any different or do they all share the same characteristics? So there are two different types of enclaves in China. One which would be kind of like Wangjing, which is an urban enclave. So we have Korean urban enclaves that are much like Wangjing in Beijing and Shanghai. And then there is a second type of enclave, which is uh, more of the rural enclave in the three northeastern provinces, which I stated before, where the Korean Chinese, they first settled in the Mao Zedong era. The major differences are the presence of the chebol. The chebol has strong influence on forming the communities in Beijing and Shanghai, and they're going to send their best people, their headquarters, a lot of their resources to Beijing and Shanghai because these are the more prominent cities, right? What you have in the rural enclaves, you still have South Korean chebol, you still have uh, South Korean businessmen, but the chebol might build factories there because real estate costs are low instead of headquarters. South Korean businessmen who don't have a lot of resources, who can't afford life in Beijing and Shanghai, will be attracted by the lower costs of living in uh, rural enclaves. And so if we want to look at how South Korean transnational capital and FDI has really changed the livelihoods of the Korean Chinese, it's really important to look at Beijing and Shanghai instead of the rural enclaves. In a more practical sense, where is Wangjin? And visually, is it distinguishable from the other districts in Beijing? So Wangjin is actually located in the fifth ring. I don't know if you're familiar with Beijing, but it's on the outskirts of the city en route to the Beijing International Airport. And in terms of its physical appearance, it's actually, it looks a lot like Korea. You have a lot of high-rise apartment buildings. It's very planned. And you know how in Pundang you have like these very clean rows of uh, high-rise apartment buildings. It looks just like that. And so the first impression that you get is it's very residential, and it's very upwardly mobile, and it looks just like Seoul. It looks just like Seoul, but does it look ethnic in the sense that if you go to Tokyo or New York, Korea towns are very clearly Korean. Is that the case in Beijing? That's a really great question, because when I first went to Wangjing, I spent about a day or two trying to find where the enclave was, and I couldn't find it. Um, that's because the Korean enclave in Osaka or the Korean enclave in New York and Manhattan, it's very clear. You have a block or two of Korean restaurants, and they're kind of all lined up, right? Wangjing is different in the sense where it's an integrated community. So, for instance, if you go to a apartment, high-rise apartment, you have what's called like a apartments hanga, right? Where in the first floor you have businesses, and then the top floors you have uh, studio apartments and apartments where people live. Wangjing is just like that. 
There are no strips of Korean restaurants, but if you actually go into the apartment, high-rise apartment complexes, integrated among these apartment buildings, you'll have on the first floor hair salons, Korean restaurants, samgyeopsal, everything that you want in Seoul is in Wangjing. According to the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, in 2009, there were roughly 70,000 South Koreans and 80,000 Korean Chinese living in Wangjing. Is the district homogeneous? Do Korean, Chinese and South Koreans live in the same streets and buildings or is it segregated? So Wangjing is actually um, really spatially segregated in the sense that there is a very clear Korean Chinese side of the enclave and there's a very clear South Korean expat where the Chebol executives live. And then there's kind of like a gray zone where some there are some kind of upwardly mobile Korean Chinese entrepreneurs as well as South Korean entrepreneurs. Is it just a question of housing or does the division run deeper? You can say that it's a little bit of both. The Korean Chinese side of the enclave first esta- was established when Hyundai moved into the enclave and they built a factory in Shunyi, which is a little above Wangjing. And in order to house these workers, they built dormitories in the Korean Chinese side, which we know as the Korean Chinese side. And they had maybe, I don't know, five to ten workers within each of the apartment units. And after that, a lot of the Korean Chinese who started to move into Wangjing started to live there. It's hard to say what it's driven by. Right now, it's probably driven by preference because in the Korean Chinese side, not only do you feel comfortable because everyone speaks the same dialect you do, but there's also like yanbian cold noodles, there's yang rou chuar, um, you know, the lamb skewers. All of these kind of Korean Chinese ethnic cuisine are the Korean Chinese style of clothing or foods. They're all kind of around these apartment complexes where their group lives. And so it makes sense that they would want to live there. A kind of more cynical view would say that it's driven also by kind of discrimination that they feel they probably don't want to live among South Koreans because they feel that maybe South Koreans look down upon them. But it's really difficult to say what it's driven by. So how do the two groups perceive each other? This was actually very difficult to get at when I was in the field. Everyone would tell me, oh, we love each other. The South Koreans would be like, oh, we love the Korean Chinese. And the Korean Chinese say, well, we don't have a problem with the South Koreans. But what I saw beneath their words were actually behaviors that demonstrated feelings of animosity and broken trust. And I try to understand why that happened. Uh, One part of my book manuscript looks at how a lot of the kind of negative media portrayals, the negative experiences they have in South Korea for the Korean Chinese, still continue to affect them when they're in Beijing. And when I thought about why, it's the same for the South Koreans as well. They're not a blank slate when they come into Wangjing. They bring with them the negative stereotypes, right? And when I thought, why does this continue? It's because a long time ago when, for instance, the Italians came to America, a lot of different types of Italians who discriminated against each other, they first would settle in into an enclave, and then over time they would build bonds of trust. This didn't happen. This is because the Italian immigrants, they settled there, and so they lost their connections to the home country, and so they saw that they had more in common than different. For the Koreans, though, they don't just settle in those communities. They're constantly moving back and forth, whether it be their families, whether it be for businesses. For both South Koreans and Korean Chinese, they're constantly moving back and forth. They're constantly watching South Korean dramas, and embedded in those South Korean dramas are negative stereotypes. And so they're constantly influenced by the stereotypes that are formed in the homeland, and that's different for transnational communities. South Koreans are influenced by preconceived ideas about Korean Chinese, but what are those ideas, those stereotypes, and what factors actually continue the reproduction of those ideas? So in South Korean society, uh, we are exposed to ideas of Korean Chinese as second-class citizens, as people who are coming to South Korea in order to make money. So There is this preconceived conception in South Korean society that the Korean Chinese are money-grubbing, that they'll kill, that they'll deceive, um, they'll manipulate you in order to make money. They're blinded by money above anything. And so this idea, combined with the fact that they're also lower class, undereducated from rural China, creates a very bad combination of perceptions, I think.
when confronted by South Koreans who have such preconceived ideas, how do Korean Chinese react? How do they feel about those stereotypes? When they're confronted by these stereotypes, it's actually a very complicated scenario because they're never confronted by these stereotypes in person. Very few, very rarely are they confronted by these stereotypes explicitly, but they feel it by consuming media and they experience it indirectly by listening to their stories of their mothers or fathers who are working in 3D labor, in 3D jobs in South Korea. A lot of it is indirectly experienced. In Wang Jing, though, what I look at is how these indirect experiences of prejudice shapes their behaviors in different ways. So what I mean by that is they know that those stereotypes exist and they assume that the South Korean that they're working with has those stereotypes against them, even if that South Korean doesn't do anything to kind of betray that he also holds these prejudiced views. But the fact that they're there and the fact that they're both aware of that really shapes the dynamics between those two people. And it shapes the dynamics because Uh, the Korean Chinese will always kind of hold suspicion over the intentions of the South Koreans. And the South Koreans, on, the, on their hand, will always be afraid that the Korean Chinese is going to swindle them of their money. Only a few generations separates these two groups. Do they believe that they share a similar ancestry? And do they believe that they belong to the same group still today? That's also a really complicated question. Obviously, they share the same ancestry. It's hard to deny that in terms of their lineage. I think the Korean Chinese have a feeling of nostalgia, and they want to feel connected to the South Koreans, but they feel betrayed because of all of these kind of larger prejudiced views that they see on TV and that they see their parents experiencing in South Korea. The South Koreans, on the other hand, take a lot of effort in order to differentiate themselves from the Korean Chinese to the extent that they call the Korean Chinese Chinese people who can speak Korean really well. So, 한국말을 잘하는 중국 사람, right? And they also, a lot of times, they use 중국 사람 in order to uh, refer to the Korean Chinese not because they don't think that they share ancestry, but because they want to emphasize their differences. And I kind of thought about why would they want to emphasize their differences? And it makes sense when you think of if Korean Chinese are seen as inferior and as second-class citizens, that you wouldn't want to be part of that group. And so for the South Koreans, it's very important for them to kind of distinguish themselves. Do they feel comfortable interacting with each other? <laughs> Do they trust each other? Yes and no. They don't feel comfortable interacting with each other, according to my survey results. But they do in the sense that they know that they need each other. And they know that there is something that sets them apart from Han Chinese. They don't acknowledge that, but it's there. And so there's always this ambivalence between comfort and discomfort, trust and feelings of betrayal. And those kind of ambivalent feelings, how they switch back and forth is what I look at uh, in my research. You mentioned they interact out of necessity. Does this mean that they only interact when it comes to work? Unfortunately, that's true. By far, their interactions are shaped in the workplace. And they don't really share kind of friendship networks. They don't have any common kind of membership in civic organizations or in churches. They don't play in the same areas. For instance, the South Koreans like to go golfing, the Korean Chinese. Even if they might golf, they might go to a different golf course. So it's very segregated in terms of their leisure and friendship networks. When it comes to work, are both Korean Chinese and South Koreans on an equal footing? Or is there an asymmetry present there? So there are very strong, sharp asymmetries in the workplace. By and large, the South Koreans are the employers, the entrepreneurs, the people, the boss. And the Korean Chinese, um, by and large, are workers or managers. And how does this affect the way they perceive each other? So in my book, I try to show how the fact that they don't have these friendship networks, 
they don't have common memberships and civic organizations, and they only interact in the workplace, which is a highly structured and where power asymmetries are present. The fact that this happens creates a very tense situation where they don't really get to know each other outside of these kind of imbalanced power dynamics. And because the Korean Chinese is always in an inferior position, kind of working for a South Korean boss, it reinforces for both sides this idea that the South Koreans are superior than the Korean Chinese and for the Korean Chinese that they are being kind of oppressed and overworked and abused and exploited by South Koreans. Is this the case? Is... It any worse working for a South Korean boss than it would be for another Chinese, maybe Han Chinese boss? I think that's hard to say. It depends on the level of the size and the scale of the company. So when you're talking about the chebol and you, you're comparing that to a kind of highly bureaucratic, very well established Chinese company, when you look at it from a long term perspective, is probably more more lucrative for you to work at a Chinese company because they'll train you and they'll invest in you and they'll uh, want you to be kind of move up the corporate ladder. But if you look at a small scale entrepreneurial firm and you compare a South Korean firm and a Han Chinese firm, there are not a lot of opportunities for you to work at a Han Chinese firm because they don't need you in the same ways that a South Korean would. A South Korean entrepreneur is desperate for a Korean Chinese manager who knows both Korean and Chinese. A Han Chinese, unless they're catering to the South Korean clientele in the enclave, are not in need of those services. There are very few of them, and so that's a very rare case. On a side note, how do the Han Chinese perceive the South Koreans living in Wangjin? This is also kind of a complex question because you want to look at what group of Han Chinese, right? Han Chinese rural migrants, Han Chinese middle class. The Han Chinese middle class, I think, who are also living in these apartment complexes, they see the South Koreans as a nuisance, as kind of bringing in their money but not really investing in China, and as very arrogant. But they live very separate lives. So when I went in and I started interviewing some of the Han Chinese residents, they knew very little about the South Koreans. Right? And they weren't able to distinguish the South Koreans from the Korean Chinese. So the communities are very isolated. Much of your field work revolved around two churches, a South Korean church sanctioned by the PRC, but only open to foreigners, and a Korean Chinese underground church. Why did you decide to conduct your participant observation there? And is there anything special about the role of churches in enclaves? The church in sociological research has always been highlighted as a really great civic organization where people are able to come together and share resources and information and really help each other bond, right? Um, so I took that idea and I looked at how the civic organization embodied in the church would kind of allow us to understand why there are bonds of trust that are not forming between the South Koreans and the Korean Chinese. One of the reasons why was because they didn't go to the same churches, right? So the kind of primary sources or primary um, places where they're able to bond were actually absent for both of them. And then I also chose the church because for Koreans, it's a very kind of prominent organization, especially in China. There is a huge wave of Korean missionaries that are entering all over China. And so this is also a great way to kind of look at the formation of Korean communities. In Europe, one's involvement with the church is often limited to Sundays and big celebrations. Is this also the case for these two churches? As you might know, and even in Seoul, right, people who go to church, especially the women, they kind of devote their lives to church, right? It's not only Sunday worship, it's Wednesday Bible study, it's Tuesday women's group meetings, it's kind of outreach programs. And this is even more intensified in Beijing because when their husbands are out working, the wives, they need a place to socialize. And so it becomes a, not only just kind of a Sunday meeting, but a hub for the community. Many of my participants who I observed spent maybe 
seven hours at church over the weekends. And then if you kind of combine their weekly totals, it would be maybe 10 to 20 hours just serving in various functions in churches. Um, this was also true for the Korean Chinese population, but it was less formal in the sense that they didn't have like formal meetings, but they had these great communities where they really relied on each other. They really loved being together. And so we would just kind of meet and socialize and go out to dinner and try to support each other in very kind of informal ways through our church networks. As we just mentioned, one church is state-sponsored, the other is underground. Why is that? The Chinese government allows both Koreans as well as Chinese to establish churches. But there are a lot of conditions that the church has to follow in order to maintain that status. And they send kind of officials and spies in a way to make sure that you're abiding by all of the regulations. So, for instance, during even in Bible study or even in various kind of informal sports events, they'll send officials as well as people embedded there who are watching you. And if you deviate, you'll get into a lot of trouble. But in order for you to have a large scale meeting, it's very hard to do that when you're in hiding, right? So the South Korean church is a mega church. There are 2,000 people who attend there. And so the only way that they were able to have a church of that size was by trying to go along with state regulations. The Korean Chinese, a lot of the Korean Chinese churches that that I think I was interested in because they had a lot of entrepreneurs, they had a very booming kind of social life, those churches, they didn't want to be bound by state regulations because they thought that it would hamper their ability to uh, form a community. And so I looked at those churches. That might kind of seem to skew my findings in the sense that uh, I find that solidarity is present in the Korean Chinese church, but not in the South Korean church. But what I also found was for South Korean underground churches, there was a high rate of turnover. There was a high rate of mortality in the sense that they disappeared very quickly and they reappeared. So it's very hard to uh, follow them. Does this mean that this division between Korean Chinese and South Korean churches is only due to the Chinese law? So as I stated before, I also looked at uh, South Korean underground churches as well as Korean Chinese state-sanctioned churches. I looked at all different types of combinations before I chose my sites of fieldwork. And what I found was that even in Korean Chinese churches, by law, you can't have South Koreans. But in Korean Chinese underground churches, they're not bound by any law. And there is only one South Korean family out of 200 members. And in the South Korean underground churches that were also not bound by law, there were no Korean Chinese members. And I, I went to maybe 10 different churches. And so this was consistent through all of the churches that I went to. So I could only uh, assume that it was driven by preference and not by law. The population in Wangjin is highly mobile, and many do not stay there for long. South Koreans tend to go back to South Korea, and Korean Chinese frequently return to their hometowns. How does this affect the two churches? So one characteristic I said of transnational enclaves is they're highly volatile. You know, whereas immigrant communities, you settle, transnational communities are always going back and forth. And when I told you briefly before that the South Korean underground churches would disappear at very rapid rates, um, that's indicative of the challenges that a lot of the South Korean organizations, civic organizations, not only the churches undergo. The Korean Chinese also have a very volatile population. But their volatility is concentrated in specific kind of fractions within the population. So, for instance, the young group, the people who are in their 20s, their 30s, who are still trying to look for kind of educational opportunities, might go to South Korea to find jobs, to build their careers, or to get graduate training. So there's a lot of kind of turnover rate among that group. There's also a lot of turnover among people who are in the 50s and 60s because they're, they're the ones who are filling kind of the factory jobs, the jobs in kind of janitorial services, right? But the key population who are 30s, 40s, 50s, those people who are the most established 
kind of see China as their home. And so even though as entrepreneurs, they might go to Korea to meet with business partners or get goods, they'll only go for a week or two and they'll come back. And so these this core population, they serve as the leaders of the population and they kind of drive the organization in a more stable way than the South Koreans are able to. The South Koreans are fluctuating all throughout demographic categories and age groups. And so there's not that level of stability in the South Korean population. In your thesis, you mentioned that, and I quote, historically Korean Chinese underground churches have received large amounts of financial and institutional support from churches in South Korea seeking to engage in missions work in China, as you also mentioned. Is that also the case for the two churches you attended? So what was really interesting was that for the mega church, they're actually a branch of a mega church in Seoul. And so they have very strong institutional ties with the Seoul headquarters. It's kind of like a chebol, if you think about it, right? The Beijing branch, right? For the Korean Chinese church, even though they had a lot of networks with South Korean missionaries, and even though they hosted a lot of South Korean mission groups, they didn't really take advantage of these networks in order to gain financial resources. And this is because they didn't want to be held accountable to this kind of prejudice view that Korean Chinese were money grubbing and that they were reliant and dependent on South Korean uh, financial resources. And they also knew that once they took money from South Korean missionaries, they would have to go along with what they wanted and they wanted independence. So they didn't take any resources. You wrote that, and I quote, while large socioeconomic gaps between Chebol employees and the entrepreneurs divide the South Korean community in Beijing into two, these gaps are largely absent within the Korean Chinese community. Could you tell us more about the internal cohesion of both the Korean Chinese church and the South Korean ones? So what I found broadly was that the Korean Chinese had a really tightly knit community, and you could tell by the church. And the South Koreans, they were fractured. They went to church, and they kind of had Bible study together, but these relationships never went beyond the surface level. And I asked why, why was it in the Korean Chinese church we have solidarity and the South Korean you don't? In the Korean Chinese church, they really bonded over this idea that they were discriminated against by the South Koreans. And so even though you have the entrepreneurs or the people who are working uh, low-wage jobs, they still felt that they were both kind of marginalized from both South Korean as well as Han Chinese societies. That was strong enough to kind of overcome their gaps in class. This was not the case, however, for the South Korean church because... The gaps in wealth between the expats who are the Chebel employees and the entrepreneurs were much more striking and much more significant than any kind of gaps in class that we would find in the Korean Chinese population. And these gaps would translate into different lifestyles, different kind of children's educational goals and career goals, and just like a different social world, right? So how can we imagine this? The South Korean entrepreneur is a very precarious economic life. You know, he's kind of living day by day. The South Korean Chebol executive, he's earning maybe twice or three times more than what he would be earning in South Korea, right? Which is very common for expats. On top of that, he has a chauffeur, he has a maid, it's all these different kind of luxurious amenities. And so when you compare that to kind of Chinese standards as well, they're living as emperors, right? And so there's this gap in kind of feeling like they're in this together, Uh, both don't feel like they're in this together. One of the themes of your dissertation is social mobility. How does this difference in cohesion affect social mobility for Korean Chinese and South Koreans? The relationship between social cohesion and mobility right, is a really important one. It's a really important one because there is a perception in sociology that transnational resources really drives an alternative pathway to uh, socioeconomic mobility. What I find is that on the surface, you have this really rich mega church, the South Korean church, kind of glistening buildings, all these resources, right? It's really kind of on the outside, it looks great. On the other hand, you have this Korean Chinese underground church. It's in a shoddy building. We have kind of fold up chairs, eat out of like, I don't know, it's just a very kind of 
more uh, humble experience that I went through. But what I found was that even though on the outside, these Korean Chinese didn't seem that they had much, this feeling of wanting to help each other through thick and thin, of helping each other not only when they're sick, but when they need economic assistance, when they need kind of know-how, this feeling of like, we're in this together, we're going to help you get through this, we're going to aggregate all of these experiences that we all went through as a group in order to help you achieve a successful business that was much more powerful than access to material resources so even though these korean chinese they didn't have much wealth the solidarity really helped them build strong and consistent entrepreneurial businesses on the other hand south koreans even though they went to church in these glistening buildings and had this very kind of fancy um, mega church connection to seoul headquarters church The entrepreneurs who were in that church, they were isolated, they felt unsupported, not only that, but they were on their own in terms of trying to help their businesses thrive, there was no sense of support, and so that was enough to make them fail even though they came to China with seed money with graduate degrees with experiences working in the chebel that didn't matter and I thought that was really interesting to find. To expand on what you just said and to quote the question you ask in the introduction of your thesis, why are South Koreans unable to achieve entrepreneurial success in the PRC and why are the Korean Chinese ethnic minorities despite their comparable lack of material wealth and human capital, able to attain access to upward mobility at such high rates? You mentioned social cohesions in churches. Is there anything else? So there are two factors. One is social solidarity, ethnic solidarity. And the second would be their ability to work as cultural brokers or cultural intermediaries who can flexibly shift between um, South Korean as well as Han Chinese societies. You mentioned that understanding how to communicate and establish rapport with key actors such as South Korean consumers, Korean Chinese managers, Han Chinese bureaucrats, and Han Chinese workers is of primary importance in running businesses in China. Starting with South Korean consumers, wouldn't one expect that South Koreans would be better able to cater to the needs of their fellow South Korean citizens? This idea comes from kind of my critique of the traditional notions of the enclave, right? Uh, Portes argued that within an enclave, if you have really strong diasporic ties, that this is kind of your key mechanism for upward mobility. And what I found is in a transnational enclave, it's not your kind of co-ethnic ties that are really important, but your ability to move flexibly within a variety of different communities in order to amass the greatest amount of resources. And how that plays out in my case study in Wangjing is it's true that the South Koreans can understand more of the nuances of their South Korean clientele, of the kimchi, for instance, right? How um, perfectly rancid it might be, right? Or what type of pechu, what kind of cabbage they use. A lot of these things are not as perfect for a Korean Chinese version of the kimchi, but the Korean Chinese can offer a lot more than just kimchi. If you go to their restaurant, They will serve you maybe a slightly weird version of kimchi, but they can tell you where to go for a grocery store. They can tell you where to buy the cheap, cheapest cabbage. And they can give you kind of these survival tips. And they can do this because they understand not only South Korea, the South Korean needs sufficiently enough, but they also understand the world of China, right? They understand how to survive in China. And this is actually more of what the South Korean clientele wants. To go back to the initial question, why do you mention Korean Chinese managers? But first, why would the manager necessarily be Korean Chinese and not South Korean who speaks Chinese? And second, why would the South Koreans, entrepreneurs, owners, be enabled to establish proper work relations with Korean Chinese managers? So for any entrepreneurial business in Wangjing that's serving the Korean clientele, you need a Korean Chinese manager, whether it be for a Korean Chinese owned business, a Han Chinese owned business or a South Korean owned business. This is because a South Korean manager is way too costly and the cost of a South Korean manager would drive your profits down. You can hire maybe five to 10 Korean Chinese managers with the same salary of one South Korean manager, 
And so in order just to keep prices down, you need a Korean Chinese, you need a local, right? If you compare locals like Han Chinese versus Korean Chinese, you have to have a Korean Chinese because they are able to understand, as I said before, both the needs of the South Korean clientele, who are the wealthiest consumers, and how to kind of deal with the Han Chinese rural migrants, who are the workers, the low wage workers, as well as the Han Chinese bureaucrats, who are always kind of making sure that you have the proper licenses and you're going along local regulations. And no one can manage all three of these groups other than a Korean Chinese manager. The last two actors were Han Chinese bureaucrats and Han Chinese workers. Why do South Koreans seem unable to interact with them easily? Is it just a question of language or is there more to it? So there's actually much more to it in the sense that, remember I said the Korean Chinese are also rural migrants. So in that sense, they're able to understand how to interact with the Han Chinese rural migrants, even in a way that upper class Han Chinese wouldn't, because they come from a very similar background of leaving their rural village to find jobs in the cities, right? And for any entrepreneur, it's very important to keep your workers happy, um, to understand their needs, to understand when they're stressed out. And so the kind of Korean Chinese manager can do this very well. At the same time, they are able to kind of form harmonious relationships with Han Chinese bureaucrats. And a lot of the Chinese literature, they kind of focus on this concept of guanxi. And we see how guanxi plays a role in this case as well, in the sense that if you don't abide by local regulations, it's very easy for your government to become overburdened with fines, inspection fines, and then have to become bankrupt, right? And have to close doors. Guanxi, according to the literature, is formed by these social rituals that are very inherent in Chinese culture. And it's very hard for a foreigner to understand what those kind of nuanced rituals are. I argue, however, that it's not just the nuanced rituals that are important, but it's this ability to establish rapport that's really important. And as you might know as a foreigner yourself, right, you have to have not only language ability, but an understanding of a society and these cultural norms that takes a long time to acquire in order to establish rapport with the local, right? And these Korean Chinese are able to do that because they've lived in China for three generations. Doesn't that mean that at the end of the day, South Korean entrepreneurs are at the mercy of their Korean Chinese managers? Yeah, so a lot of what my project tries to do is dismantle these perceptions that you would have. Like the church that's wealthy in its exterior would provide resources. It doesn't, right? Or that the South Korean entrepreneur who's coming in with a lot of money, has a lot of power at the beginning, is actually in power. He's not, right? The person who's actually in power is the Korean Chinese manager. And if the South Korean entrepreneur knew that, he would maybe spend more effort in trying to establish harmonious relationships with them. But they're actually unable to see that. And they kind of treat them as inferior. And because there's not a lot of trust between them, the Korean Chinese manager is actually able to exercise a lot of discretionary power. They can do this because a lot of times in the room, they're the only ones who can understand both Korean and Chinese. And so they can kind of shift what their entrepreneur is saying when they're translating certain things to their advantage. Or when they're kind of managing the accounting books, maybe they might be able to slip themselves some money. They have a lot of these kind of power in ways that are not obvious. You can maybe also understand this, right? For instance, the administrative staff, wherever you go, they have a lot of discretionary power and you need to kind of have a good relationship with them in order to have a smooth transaction, right? It's the same for the Korean Chinese. Going over your research, it appears that at the core of this mutual dislike that both groups feel is an underlying a resentment of being vulnerable, of being at the mercy of the other group. Do you think that this is a fair assessment of the situation? They are very vulnerable to each other. The Korean Chinese, if they didn't have the South Koreans, they wouldn't have the money in order to even build businesses in the first place. They wouldn't have the career experience that they need in order to build businesses. They know that they're at the mercy of the South Koreans. And they hate the fact that they have to rely on them financially 
the South Koreans, on the other hand, even though they come into the enclave thinking that they're powerful, very quickly they realize that they're not. They're at the mercy of the Korean Chinese managers in order to build successful businesses. And a lot of them, a lot of the men that I interviewed actually had failed businesses. And they felt that they were cheated by their managers. And so there was this very kind of strong feeling that if it weren't for the Korean Chinese, we would have been able to succeed in China. I think the question of whether or not they feel resentment because of their vulnerability is a very difficult one. But the fact that they are vulnerable, their livelihoods are vulnerable and inextricably intertwined with each other. And the fact that they're very resentful towards each other. These are very correct assessments. As said previously, South Korea seems desperate to find Korean-Chinese uh, intermediates. Do they really win in that relationship? Doesn't that cut them off from the real Han Chinese society? So the South Koreans, as you mentioned before, are resentful of the Korean-Chinese middlemen, are also very vulnerable, even though they don't seem vulnerable on the out outside. What my research tries to do is show how enclave entrepreneurs are different from what we had imagined before. So, for instance, South Korean immigrants in America are widely acclaimed for gaining upwardly mo mobility among sociologists, right? They're kind of seen as the paradigm of immigrant entrepreneurship. You have a very similar group of South Koreans also entering into Beijing very similar levels of education and levels of resources, but they're failing at very high rates. And they're going back to South Korea after not being able to achieve mobility. A lot of the reason why is because the enclave, instead of providing them with resources, it actually sequesters them from the Han Chinese society. And they're overly reliant on the Korean Chinese in order to survive in Beijing. And by relying on these intermediaries, they're unable to build the type of language skills and the cultural skills that would eventually allow them to become more independent and more in control of where their businesses are headed. And this is why I argue that the enclave works in very different ways for the transnational communities. On the one hand, even though it benefits the Korean Chinese, it leads to the downfall of the South Koreans. But isn't that just a very unique situation where there is a middleman available to navigate both South Korean entrepreneurs and the local Han Chinese community? In other words, how easily can you generalize your argument? That's a really great question and something that I really uh, struggle with as my research progresses. It's hard to say how generalizable my findings are, but I would argue that we would find very similar trends around the world. What I mean by that is that with globalization, your ethnic communities are becoming more and more culturally diverse in the sense that there are different waves of co-ethnics that are living together. So in Japan, you have not only South Koreans who are coming into Japan, but you also have Korean Japanese, very similar situation. In America, you have not only fresh waves of South Koreans who are continuing to come into America, but also Korean Americans. You can also find that with other kind of ethnic groups as well. Whereas before you had more of a streamline of immigrants who are succeeding in various different generations, now because of the liberalization of laws, you have kind of vastly different waves of migrants who are bound together by ethnicity, right? And these kind of ethnic communities are much more complex than what we had found before. What I'm arguing then is within these kind of complex groups, complex communities, it's much more difficult to create a community than we had. And so instead of relying on just your ethnic community, a successful transnational entrepreneur needs to be able to find a variety of different sources of resources, not just within their enclave, but also within the homeland, within the host society. And this allows them to become more independent, more flexible, and have stronger kind of businesses. As Chinese laws are liberalizing, are we seeing an evolution of relations between Korean Chinese and South Koreans? So as I said, you know, the WTO was a huge turning point for the South Korean presence in China. Because not only do you have well-established Chebol who are entering into China, but more kind of grassroots South Korean entrepreneurs who want to start small businesses in China. 
So that's one way in which the liberalization of laws is changing the South Korean presence. Another way that you can look at it is that with the liberalization of laws, how I look at it is of more kind of local laws have to abide more by strict institutional standards. And this would kind of weaken the need for guanxi because if everything is done by law, then you have less discretionary power in adjudicating those laws. In that way, it could protect the South Koreans maybe more from Korean Chinese who are trying to kind of manipulate their vulnerable status. But my primary argument, though, is not changing in the sense that it's not just guanxi, it's that the South Koreans even don't understand what the laws are in the first place. And they need the Korean Chinese to translate what those laws are for them. And they need the Korean Chinese to fill out all these administrative documents for them. And so I really don't see their relationship changing dramatically at this point. So what would be the next step? What would be needed to improve relations between the two groups, Korean Chinese and South Koreans? So my research shows that what's really important, what's really missing are these friendship networks. And where do people make friends? They make friends in kind of civic organizations or common places of leisure. But because the enclave is spatially segregated between the Korean Chinese and South Koreans, they don't really come across each other in places when they're not working. And this is really detrimental. So if I were trying to advise a Korean Chinese or South Korean who was asking me, you know, what can I do to help this community, I would say, you know, try to build some kind of place where both South Koreans and Korean Chinese can come and build relationships where they see each other, not within an economic or work related context, where they can kind of build an understanding of why they are behaving in the ways that they are. And from there, hopefully those feelings of trust where they form that are formed in those kind of settings will also trickle down in their places of work and allow them to kind of overcome different barriers of trust. In conclusion, if today a South Korean family came to you saying they wanted to set up shop in Beijing, would you advise them to go there or should they rather stay in Korea and open up some other kind of business? So I actually have some friends who are really interested in going into the Chinese markets, right? And I always give them a cautionary warning, telling them that a lot of my research findings shows that most people fail. So I would caution them into going. But there are certain types of people who are able to make it work. Those types of people are very kind of humble. Even if they have resources, they don't flaunt it. They know how to build relationships of trust and kind of bend over backwards in order to understand their workers, right? So those relationships with their workers are really key in making your uh, business viable. Also, if you have a strong background in, in China and Chinese, if you're fluent in Chinese, even if you still have a Korean Chinese manager, that really protects you from a lot of discretionary power that your middlemen might exercise. So for instance, if you're in a business meeting with a Han Chinese partner and your Korean Chinese translator is kind of twisting your words around, if you have enough Chinese ability, you know what they're saying and you can kind of show them that you're the one in, in control, right? So if you have that level of linguistic confidence, I would say you could go, right? and that you can do well, yeah. Before finishing this interview, is there any story, anything that marked you during your field work that you would like to share with us? Um, so my experience in the field was marked by my background as a second generation Korean American. I initially went into the field thinking that I would, because I'm a Korean American, would be able to establish ties with both the Korean Chinese as well as the South Koreans. But what I found was that the Korean Chinese really saw me as a South Korean. And the South Korean, once they knew that I was involved in Korean Chinese organizations, saw me as a traitor. And this kind of showed me two things. One is that in the enclave, you're either a Korean Chinese or a South Korean. You're kind of categorized in both one side or the other. There's no kind of middle ground. And second is, it's that kind of bifurcated. The community is bifurcated. The trust is compromised to that extent that it was so difficult for me to establish ties. I remember when I first went into the Korean Chinese underground church, 
I had to sit among the congregation in Sunday service for three months before someone talked to me because from my appearance, the way that I spoke Korean, they assumed that I was South Korean. I wanted to join the choir and one of the choir members accused me of being perhaps associated with a cult and that was why I couldn't join. And so time and time again, all of my kind of efforts to volunteer, to show them that I was there to serve their community was interpreted in a suspicious way. And this was very different from my first entree into the South Korean community. When I first entered the South Korean community, from the first week, I was part of the praise band, right? I helped them translate things. And they were very welcoming of my efforts. But then later on, when they realized that I was a researcher and that I was also studying the Korean Chinese, they started to kind of take a step back and question my motives. And they told me that I shouldn't trust the Korean Chinese, that I shouldn't get closer to them. And so a lot of my research and a lot of my fieldwork experience was really marked by the stress and this anxiety of having to go between both communities, having to try and establish relationships of trust, having to prove myself. And it only allowed me to kind of bodily experience what I was trying to argue, which is that, you know, solidarity between these two groups is just so difficult to form. And that's a very... I think, unfortunate consequence of transnationalism. Professor Sharon Yoon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.